Good morning and welcome to our study of God's Word on the first Lord's Day of April. Today will be a special day at Pyburn Street Church of Christ and we invite you to come and be our guest. This morning, Brother Ted Knight will be with us in both our Bible class at 9 and in worship at 9.50. Brother Knight is a longtime friend of the Pyburn Street Church. He's an outstanding gospel preacher and also serves as a missionary to Romania. We will look forward to hearing him proclaim God's word this morning. Following morning services, we'll have a potluck lunch. And then we will also meet this evening at 6 o'clock, and we'll be considering the third lesson in a series entitled On the Safe Side. Tonight, we'll be discussing the adding of rules which God has not mandated. We also gather on Wednesday evenings at 6 p.m. for midweek Bible study. And we would love for you to come and be our guest at Pyburn Street Church of Christ. In the Old Testament book of Numbers, we find that the children of Israel were forced to travel out of their way and go around the land of Edom. The reason for this, the king of Edom would not allow them to pass through his land. The children of Israel, being cousins of the Edomites by way of Jacob and Esau, began to resent the difficult way that they had to travel, and they began to complain to God. In Numbers 21 and verse 5, the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore, have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. You know, isn't that just like the Israelites? After all that God had done for them, they were still not appreciative of all his goodness and mercy. They had just finished asking God to deliver them from the Canaanites whom God provided them with deliverance from. And look two verses up to verse 3. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them in their cities. And he called the name of the place Ormah. God became so disturbed with the ingratitude and the grumbling that he caused deadly serpents to come into the camp and to bite many people. And we're told in verse 6 that many of the people of Israel succumbed to the snake bite. Many of them passed away. Well, it didn't take long for the people to realize that having to go around Edom wasn't really that bad after all. And the manna provided from heaven, you know, that really wasn't that bad either. They realized that they needed to be more appreciative of God. Verse 7 says, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we've spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord chose to correct the problem by a rather unusual method. He didn't have Moses offer a sacrifice for the people's sins. Instead, notice what he did. He didn't force the people to eat the manna with complaining. He gave Moses a remedy for the snake bites. Verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a person came that had been bitten by a serpent, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, why did God choose to make poisonous snakes bite these ungrateful, complaining people and then choose to remedy the problem by having Moses construct a snake out of brass, place it on a pole, and then require everyone who was bitten, who wanted to live, to come and look upon this snake? It's a very interesting question. Well, once again, God is taking care of a problem with one set of people and at the same time teaching another group of people an important lesson. Do we ever hear of this brass serpent and pole again? Well, yes, we hear about it two more times, in fact. 
During the reign of Hezekiah as king of Israel, we find that the children of Israel had kept the brass serpent and had turned it into an idol. In 2 Kings 18 and verse 4, he, referring to Hezekiah, removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break into pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called the place Nehushtan. The other time that this serpent is mentioned is in the book of John. You may remember that Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, and during the course of this conversation, Jesus made several very well-known statements. Jesus spoke of one's need to be born again. He spoke of the fact that God so loved the world. But then right in the middle of these two famous discussions, Jesus makes reference to the serpent that Moses crafted in the wilderness. In John 3, verses 14 and 15, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. In another instance, Jesus made reference to his being lifted up as an inference to the kind of death that he would suffer. In John 12, beginning in verse 12, it says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven, saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it, said that it thundered. Others said, An angel spake to him. And Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This incident in the wilderness that we see mentioned here, this incident with fiery serpents, it was a means of punishing the wrongdoers. But we find that it was also a prophetic reference to the kind of death that the Messiah would face to bring about the salvation of the world's sins. If wounded souls would come to him as he was lifted up as the Savior, then they too would be healed of their spiritual wounds. There's a key phrase that's mentioned here that I would like for us to use as our key text. I will draw all men unto me. Well, what did Jesus mean when he said this? He said that it would be accomplished by his being lifted up or being crucified. But how can Jesus, being cruelly killed on a Roman cross, be an attracting factor to mankind? Well, let's notice a few scriptures that give us some insight into this statement. In Jeremiah 31 and verse 3, the prophet says, The Lord hath appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn thee. Friends, when Jesus died on the cross, he demonstrated to all mankind for all time the love that God had for them. Jesus was discussing this same concept in John 3 when he injected the thought, So must the Son of Man be lifted up. Well, for the very next words Jesus spoke after this remark, he said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Hence the need to draw all men to the Savior. There is only one way that people will come to Jesus for the saving power that only he can bestow. Remember, the saving power in numbers came only from the brass serpent, and that way was for them to know of God and his gift of grace through Christ. In John 6, verses 44 and 45, Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. God's intention is for everyone to appreciate 
and take advantage of this offering of Jesus as an indication of God's love for mankind. This gesture of love on God's part is certainly sufficient to trigger in our minds the need for God's grace and mercy and should draw us to Christ. This drawing power of the crucifixion of Christ and all that it implies demands a response on our part as well. The children of Israel had to do their part to be healed of the deadly snake bites. And you recall that Moses was instructed to craft the serpent on the pole. Well, now that God had done his part in offering a remedy to the snake bites through Moses' creation of the serpent, the responsibility now rests upon the people to take action. They had to come and look upon the serpent in order to be healed. Now, if someone had been bitten or had been bitten by one of these fiery serpents and devised their own plan or remedy to the problem, then they would have died. God gave them a command to look upon the serpent, and those who obeyed him lived. Well, friends, we too must act upon God's commands in order to access the saving power of Jesus Christ. God has done his part. Now we must draw nigh unto him. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. Hebrews 7 and verse 19. Now in our drawing near to God, we must be sincere in our devotion to him. We cannot fake an appreciation and worship of God. It must be from the heart, and it must be according to his will. In Hebrews 10, verses 22 and 23 says, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Now there are those who attempt to come to God on the outside but have no real intentions of coming to God with their heart and soul. They have religion, but are not committed to following God in every walk of life. Hence, Jesus says in Matthew 15, verses 7 through 9, Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, These people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. God has so devised his plan that if we will learn of his goodness and mercy and will respond to his gift of grace by obeying his commands, then he will come even closer to us. He will reveal even more of himself to us. James 4 and verse 8, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. God has done what he deemed necessary to offer man a way of escape from his own sins, and he did this by offering Jesus as a sacrifice. He's given to man the knowledge through his word to understand God's gift and requirements in order to receive that gift. Now, God is not looking for some way to destroy man. We've given him that opportunity the very first time we sinned as an accountable person. But God is wanting to save us from destruction. 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4, speaking of God, Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth? And then in John 8, verses 31 and 32, then said Jesus to the Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Friends, God has shown us his love. Jesus was lifted up, and that is the drawing power that pulls souls searching for salvation to Christ Jesus. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. 
Friends, we thank you for joining us for our program on this Lord's Day, and we pray that God blesses you with a wonderful day.